Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Sam, super excited for this one. I can I cannot wait to dive into your story and your journey, doing a lot of research. Um, you had everything, but at the same time, you didn't, right? And and I I've heard this story numerous times, but everyone's path is a little different. So I'm really interested to dig a little deeper into your journey. Journey, and uh, but first and foremost, how's it going over there? Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm excited to dive into this. And it's always nice to hear people did some research and it resonates and things like that. So yeah, that'll be fun. This is going to be fun. I'm doing well. So thanks for checking in. And I'm just excited to see where this conversation is going to take us. I don't know where it's going to go. I yeah. got notes here, but sometimes the magic is just letting it go where it goes. And that's those are the best conversations. Let's just be in it, let's be present, which I know something that you focus on is being present in the moment. Something I suck at unless I'm on the microphone. <laughs> so I'm going to learn a lot from this episode. Um, so you are an author, you're a keynote speaker, a TEDx speaker, super cool. Just kind of curious. I've talked to numerous TEDx speakers. I never really asked them, um, how did that come about? How does it feel to be a TEDx speaker, be on YouTube and thousands and thousands of people watching your stuff? How cool is that? Yeah, I mean, I have a story for that that we can either unpack now or maybe a little bit later. It might be a little bit of a longer story. But um, to answer that question directly, it, it feels great. It also feels like um, there's some lessons to be learned. And that's the part uh, that we could unpack. <laughs> yeah, no. let's, um, let's organically get there. Um the first thing that comes to mind, if I'm, if someone is like, Hey, Ryan, we want you to speak uh, at a TEDx. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is imposter syndrome. Like, what am I doing up here? Did you have any of that? Like who, who contacted who to be the speaker? And did you have any thoughts of like imposter syndrome when you're standing up there in front of all these people? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't necessarily have imposter syndrome because I got into keynote speaking two years before. So I've been, awesome. um, you know, in, speaking for a while and for me how getting into public speaking started was actually actually teaching yoga and teaching yoga and being teaching at my studio that i've been going to for several years sometimes twice a day when i was in the thick of it and it also being the number one yoga studio out here in santa cruz me teaching yoga, um, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. And then I started to lead men's groups and I started to get more comfortable uh, teaching yoga and leading men's groups and things like that. And then about a year later, I got into public speaking, keynote speaking. And that was actually pretty easy. The The hard part was kind of um, coming up with the content and the flow of the presentation and speeches. But in terms of like speaking in front of people, the yoga uh, teaching yoga actually paved such a good pathway for me because I had major imposter syndrome. One, because the studio I was teaching at is amazing. Two, because I'm a student there. So like some <laughs> people know me, whatever else. Three, because I'm a man and I still have some of that conditioning being like, oh, and I even, you know, like a yoga teacher. 
And then the fourth thing being, I'm not even that flexible, you know? <laughs> <Neither> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I had so much coming up in terms of imposter syndrome, teaching yoga, but uh, it took me a while to get comfortable speaking on stage. But by the time my TEDx came, I was applying to a lot of different ones. And I was talking with one, a friend of mine who I met at a boot camp for public speakers, and he kind of became a friend and slash a little bit of a informal mentor. And I was just talking with him about TEDx and he was like, you know, I run uh, TEDx, right? I was like, you run one. So I got hooked up through a friend. Um, I think a lot of times that can happen in the speaking world because you start to know people that way. But it, it took a while to actually get one. You know, I was applying when I was just getting into speaking and I had a Google document with the most common questions that you would see in a, a TEDx application. And what I did right was having a Google doc so I could like copy paste and like apply to a bunch at once. What I did wrong was I wasn't really catering what my talk was specific to that TEDx conference because each of them have different themes. So maybe for anyone listening that might be interested in TEDx, I I could give them a little tip, you know? Yeah, it sounds like a cover letter <laughs> from when you're applying yeah, for yeah, jobs. It's like, yeah. copy, paste, copy, paste. Just remember to change the name at the top, right? You're not going to get that job. <laughs> there, yeah. So you are the founder, the creator of Soul Life Balance, right? You I mean, that that term is yours, Soul Life Balance, correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, as much as anything can, any one of us can be a creator of something, right? You know, I'm thinking about like the collect collective consciousness and downloads from, you know, higher self or the collective consciousness, whatever we want to say. But when I was in the thick of my depression in 2019, the year I was named Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list, I sat with the plant medicine ayahuasca. And the message for soul life balance came through in the ayahuasca ceremony. And it makes sense because ever since high school, I was wanting to obtain this elusive state of work-life balance. And then in this ayahuasca ceremony, uh, uh, five years ago, almost six years ago at this point, this message of soul life balance came through. And that was really the beginning of my spiritual journey where I started to make a lot of different changes in my life. And I was just coming off writing my first three books in less than a year. And I knew I would eventually like get into speaking and write a book on soul life balance, but I was so green and so new to spirituality that I was like, I don't know what this is. So it took me like three years to really do some deep inner work to be like, oh, okay, this is what the message is actually about. Wow. Wow. Okay. So you've yeah, already said some, some impressive stuff. Um, three books, 40, was it top 40, under 40 at Silicon Valley? I mean, you, I also know that you also built a million plus dollar business as well. Like you are living the life that a lot of people strive, right? And that's kind of what you thought you should do is aim for those goals and hit them. And then it's what easy cruising the rest of the way, right? You, you've hit those achievements, hit those accomplishments. Um, that's not how it turned out. And that's not how it turns out for a lot of people when they hit their goals. Um, I know sometimes like the whole more mo money, more problems type of thing. Also like, I don't know, once you climb that hill, it's like, what's next? What's next? You got to maintain. Um, I Maybe I'm wrong, but once you run this business, then you're probably buying a bigger car. You have a bigger house. Then you have to maintain all that. And then the status and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I want, I want you to kind of talk to me about your journey and what you thought that you should be doing and then how you felt when you got there and you, you hit the peak of what, where you thought you should be. Yeah, I mean, uh, I very much had a chip on my shoulder for a lot of different reasons. And I think it kind of stems back to getting a DUI when I was 22, uh, give or take. And um, I remember coming back to a campsite in South Lake Tahoe, at, like the next morning after being in jail and there being some guys there. We, we had like 30 people. I was in college at this campsite for the 4th of July in South Lake Tahoe. And someone said like jokingly like welcome to the club and the first thing i thought was like i don't want to be in your club you know and i i started to go back to my college like we went back to college to the town 
and j- different parties. I was drinking water and things like that. And I was living above the most popular bar in town, top frat, um, you know, a monster energy drinks rep, a spring break rep, uh, rep for an anti hangover company, like having the, the college life at party school, Chico state. And, um, yeah, I remember just like drinking water and different things and being like, yeah, I'm just trying to cut back. And people, you know, being with that type of energy, like welcome to the club, you know, and I very much felt like my life was over. Like it was, it was a big deal for me to, um, have had a DUI. So, um, within a year, this idea for my first business came through and that ended up being the million dollar company Swagworks. It took about eight years or so to get it to seven figures. Um, but yeah, I had that chip on my shoulder be like, I, I want to prove something, you know, like I, I am, I'm not mess up. And then when I went home to Silicon Valley after college, you know, being a guy around 2012, that selling branded merchandise, promotional products, swag. Um, that's not really impressive in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, it's like, what's your startup? What's your thing? And like, you could just feel it. Like people didn't have to say anything. It was just like when the body language would change. So I elevated the company to be like an agency. So we did graphic design, we did video production, but our main thing was promotional products. But still, I had this chip on my shoulder. And then my parents have an office supply company. They've had it for 44 years uh, to date now. Back then, I was uh, kind of co-joined with their office supply company. And my dad just wanted uh, some uh, press in the local paper. And this is a fun story. So, you know, I was born in 1988. My dad started his business by selling and repairing typewriters. His dad had a business of selling and repairing typewriters. My dad ended up uh, turning that business into an office supply company. So I was writing this story on a typewriter in 2012, <laughs> and it took me like over an hour to write. Like I, you know, it was like, I can't go back. Story. Not the lead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I basically wrote out the story. I sent it to a few of the local papers and no one wanted to pick it up. And it was about like, you know, how they're the last remaining independently family owned office supply company in Silicon Valley. And like, you know, third, uh, technically calling myself third generation. And now it's a marketing agency. And I was like 23 at the time. And I was on the board of the Santa Clara Chamber of Commerce and the San Francisco 49ers had just moved uh to santa clara so you know there's a lot of big influential people i I was networking with so i felt like i let my dad and my parents down by not being able to get that exposure so all of that kind of answers that question in terms of like where this all came from like it was it was this chip on the shoulder that um you know at the time too maybe not the time a few years later draymond green came on the scene with the warriors and growing up a Warriors fan that really resonated with like Dre and even Steph kind of got snubbed in the draft yeah. too, you know? And, yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of people that have a chip on their shoulder that use that as fuel. And that was kind of my story. So it sounds like, at least in your early to mid twenties, you felt the need to kind of prove to others, um, especially with the feedback you were getting about the company that you were running in Silicon Valley compared to others. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, it just got me thinking, um, can somebody be happy if they're constantly living in the state of trying to prove others wrong? Mm, that's, that's a good question. I don't think so. I, I think um, anytime we have resistance, that throws us off of balance within. And if we're trying to prove something because we feel inadequate, that goes a directly against everything I'm about. Like in the new book, Overcome the Overwhelm, I have the six step breath process. And what it's about is accepting and surrender, then alchemization. You know, there's this toxic movement of toxic positivity, like never entertain a negative thought or feeling, but that actually creates more dis-ease in the body. So going back to your question, question about like needing to prove someone wrong like that is in a place of resistance avoidance numbing distraction and looking for external validation Mm. in my belief system yeah it's um 
I go back and forth on this a lot. It sounds like we're both into athletics, which is awesome. Um, you hear the Tom Brady story, right? He played like 20 something years being with a chip on his shoulder because he was the six round pick or whatever he was. All these teams passed on him and look where that got him, right? It can, it can propel you in life. So it's like, I imagine there has to be some kind of a balance, like a little chip on your shoulder maybe propels you to a different tier or something like that. But at the same time, you can't be in that constant state or you're just going to be consistently trying to chase the next goal and just not really be happy or present in the moment with what you got. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be different for different people. And that's why I said like in my belief system, you know, cause there's plenty of stories. Um, one that's coming to mind right now is Steve Weatherford and, he might even be affiliated with Element. I don't know. He's a, a big time influencer. And uh, do you know who Steve Weatherford? No, explain yeah. who he is. Yeah. So he was a kicker or punter on the New York Giants. And he's probably got like over a million followers, I would imagine, at this point, like on Instagram. Uh, he he's legit. He's all about like human optimization and you know, he's uh, very outspoken. But when to your point of this being a common story. When I started to wake up to like my story and being unhappy once I reached the summit, synchronistically, I just came, this was back in 2019, I came across Steve Weatherford's uh, content and his story was about how he won the Super Bowl with the New York, Gi New York Giants and how he was like, I thought I'd feel different. I thought this was like, I prepared so long and like, you know, I, he made a big kick in the game, whatever else. And, you know, he was very much a part of it. It wasn't like he was a bench former even and, yeah, yeah you know that's just one really good story of what i say is like for me personally winning uh or being named silicon valley's 40 under 40 list at just 31 years old you know that was like my version of the super bowl of what i was chasing in relativity right you know and i think for the makeup of the type of person I am, we can look to someone like this example of this, this kicker, Steve Weatherford being similar with someone like uh, Tom. Maybe it's a different makeup. Maybe there's something else that drives them or, and, or maybe perhaps he's not at that breaking point yet, you know, and mm. that's something to consider as well. And I don't know, I just know what my belief system is. And for me, we could get into this and I, this is what the Ted talks about, but it's this philosophy of sadhana and it means to be in pursuit of, and basically in my yoga teacher training in Costa Rica, my yoga instructor said to name your ultimate potential is to limit your ultimate potential. And when he said those words, my mind like melted because I realized, oh, wow, I had named my ultimate potential being named Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list. Hmm. So now the reframe of the chip on the shoulder is not having the carrot on the stick that we're chasing or being like a hamster on a wheel, realizing that we're not going to name our ultimate potential. And perhaps I'll close it with this. Perhaps for someone like Tom Brady using this example, it never was the Super Bowl that equated to his worth. Maybe what happened with Steve and I and other people, archetypes like us, is we equate it to our worth. Maybe Tom Brady was already there and he never equated it to his earth, <laughs> earth worth because this is the point where we start to reframe it and be like, oh, I'm not equating this to my worth and I, I'm still going to pursue goals and dreams. I'm just not going to see it as my ultimate potential. Love this. Yeah, I love this because as as somebody, I'm very goal oriented. And I think there's a lot of benefit in that. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of negative to that too. Always being striving for the next thing, not really being happy and content with like where you are and being present. Something I really waffle back and forth on. And now being a new dad myself, it's like, oh, congrats. thank you. Um, you know, I look at everything a little differently now. What are some of the traits that I want to pass on to my son? What What are the things I want my son to see me do? And what are some of the things I don't want him to see me do? Um, he's also taught me to be kind of a little more present in the moment. There's a lot of times now I'm just playing with him on the floor and the phone in the other room and I'm just focusing on him. It's like, wow, this is really nice. I don't have anything else to think about. It is it is very nice. Um, Getting back to your story. So we, you are named the, the top 40 under 40, which is your goal, you go from success where what, what we deem as success to depression 
to ayahuasca in Costa Rica. We got to connect some links there. I yeah, get it. Yeah. I get it. I've had these conversations. Trust me, I've had the conversations with ayahuasca and how eye-opening it is for people. So as far as depression goes, I kind of want to describe it. Was it over time or was it just a moment you're like, God damn, I'm, de- I'm depressed. Like, what did depression look like for you and how did you put a finger on that? Hello, darkness, my old th- friend. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think um, through my life, I've um, experienced depression more often than not and w- never had the tools to articulate it, to allow myself to feel it, uh, which gets into the tools of like working through it and working with it. Um, and then one thing I've been um, thinking and feeling into more recently was a few traumas in college, one of which being that I was in the living room speaking of this. Wow, it's coming full circle. Uh, so when the Giants won the Super Bowl the second time against the Patriots in 2008, I think it was against Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> and this was probably the Super Bowl that our friends uh, Steve Weatherford won that I was referring to earlier. We, uh, myself and some buddies were in the living room and after, and we were sophomores in college. We didn't do the whole party thing. We actually watched the game and, um, you know, in the post game, they're talking about like how proud Peyton Manning must be as an older brother. And then uh, Peyton, Eli's uh, father, Archie, who played in the league as well. It was a very family feel good story. And like, I just remember how proud Peyton must be, you know, and them talking about as an older brother. And then, um, yeah, at this point, like we're in college, so we're probably like smoking bowls or whatever it was <laughs> after, after drinking, you know, and just kind of decompressing. And then um, we, there's a knock on the door and it's one of our friends. His name's, we'll say his name's uh, Pete. His older uh, brother, we'll say his name's Jeff. And Jeff's at the door and he looks ridiculous. He's a few years older than us. He's wearing cowboy boots. We're in Northern California, so it's kind of like a country uh, college town. He's wearing cowboy boots, Wranglers, a bright red shirt that's with white lettering that says Sunday Fun Day, and a camo jacket on top of that. Like just looking ridiculous, you know, and <laughs> you can tell he also just got home from the bars, but he had a concerned look on his face and he asked where his younger brother was. And we say he's in his room. So he runs to the the back room and he kicks down the door and we hear a scream. And then um, you know, the younger brother is hanging and he ended up um, dying from suicide. So that was oh, that was in your that was in the house where you were. Yeah, we were in the living room. Like I saw him. So he, oh he my used God. a electrical cord to hang himself. And I remember seeing him walk out, grab electrical cord and go back to his room. But like never in a million years would I just, we were all were like, you know, I think we were smoking cigarettes because I was in college and, you know, and smoking when I drank back then and we all smoked. Um, And I remember him coming out and he was smoking with us and he, he just wasn't there. Like, you know, his, he just wasn't there and he just went straight to his room. And then we, we talked about it. We we're like, Oh, I hope he's okay. You know? Um, but then, uh, yeah, he grabbed the cord and then he hung himself. So the, that was one of those traumas uh, in college specifically where like I just went deeper on like numbing and avoiding myself, avoiding everything. Yeah, avoiding my, myself, you know, drugs, alcohol, all the things until that summer I was a camp counselor and working with kids and being in South Lake Tahoe. There's Tahoe popping up again. Yeah. Um, you know, that was really healing. So. I think when I experienced this depression in 2019, after the success and everything else, it was like a bubble up of stuff from my childhood from, you know, maybe what was at that point, 10 years previous with uh, that story I just told, like all kinds of unprocessed stuff and just existential angst. Um, The depression I was experiencing was a numbing depression. And how a numbing depression shows up for me is like an alertness of energy. You know, it's pretty much not sleeping through the night, like usually just a few hours and then waking up and just being alert, but not uh, like having more energy than when you're tired. It was just like this alertness, 
but also just not feeling anything. And I couldn't even work out, not because of the lack of sleep, but just because maybe because of the lack of sleep, but um, just totally and utterly depleted. So I'll pause there because there's a second part of this that links how ayahuasca came into it, but that's a lot. So I'll pause there. Yeah. What I was not expecting that turn. Um, I can see how that could be a really traumatic event for anybody in that situation. Um, wow. Just my heart goes out to him and his family and, and you all for the entire situation. That's, that's wow. That's an incredibly difficult. And yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I've had a lot of conversations recently with a lot of like therapists or doctors and we talk about how the childhood affects so much. Um, Looking back before we start connecting more dots with with ayahuasca and psychedelics, looking back, is there anything you wish you would have possibly done different or be like more self-aware or looked yourself in the mirror a little more? Is there any like word if you can go back in time or and like talk to yourself when you were younger, is there any mm. like, specific advice that you would give that 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 younger version? Have you ever done a inner child like meditation or visualization? Not re. I don't believe so. Ryan, you're getting some uh, some fun stories out of me that I, I haven't shared. <laughs> I, I love it. I hope this is cool because this is the it. deep stuff. Yeah, yeah. You're asking great questions. So, um, when I first got into this world in 2020, so a year after doing ayahuasca, I did this inner child visualization, and it was one of my favorite movies growing up. Was Bill and Ted. So I've, I and Back to the Future. So I very much have always been interested in like this idea of time travel and and how like things can change. So when we ask, when you ask, like, what advice could I give to my younger self, or what could have I done differently? One thing that was mind blowing for me when I did this child uh, inner child visualization was I got to experience tr time travel for myself without any use of psychedelics or <laughs> anything at all, just through this visualization. But it took me back to a time in my childhood when I had a, essentially a dagger, but we can call it, um, and, it, you know, I had it pretty close to my forearm. And this is uh, when I was a little kid. And I had totally forgotten this memory, but what came through in the meditation, the visualization was that I was visiting my inner child then, and I almost like blacked out in terms of having this memory, like it was repressed for sure. But when I was doing this meditation, it was like, oh my God, this is what happened here. This always happened because I was always going to come to the place of doing this meditation. And it's in this meditation now that I'm speaking with my inner child. And that happened back then, which is happening right now. And I hope the listeners are following because <laughs> this gets to uh, into some super existential es esoteric type things. But I mean, one journey with uh, mushrooms or bufo or ayahuasca one journey with any of these medicines and you'll be like wow this guy's not crazy <laughs> you'll be like okay i get what he's saying but when you have these experiences um and you do those a medicine especially when you're new on the path it's like whoa so all that to say like i do believe that we can change the past by changing the present and i'm still playing with my belief there because I, I don't know how extreme that we can go with that. There is something called the Mandela effect where anyone listening, this is a fun rabbit hole, Google the Mandela effect and you'll see all of these different things that show up where it's like, wow, I remember something differently. Like one of them that's coming to mind right now is the Monopoly guy. Does he have a monocle one eyeglass? Uh, I, I'm going to say no. Is that Colonel Sanders? No, no, no the Monopoly guy. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, I'm going to say no. I think Colonel I'll, Sanders has the, does he have it? Does he have the he one? He doesn't, but I remember him having the monocle. And then there's like Jiffy peanut butter, peanut butter versus Jiff. There's the Berenstein versus the Berenstein, uh, Berenstein versus Berenstein. There's a bunch of these like where 
if you look at them and you do this with a friend and you just kind of like look at first, ask yourself what you remember, then ask like maybe your spouse or just a friend, a buddy. It's a fun little game to play because most of us remember things as they were versus how they are now. And this gets into timelines. And what's super exciting for me is the movie Everything Ever everywhere all at once won an Oscar. And that's what this movie is about. It's about how alternate timelines exist and how we are coming in and out of timelines, maybe not to the extreme of that movie because it was like silly. And it, uh, that's part of why it won an Oscar because it was entertaining, but it also has a lot of truth to it as well. So I don't really get caught up in like, oh, I wish I could have done this differently. Because not in a way where I'm spiritually bypassing, which that means to justify my belief or behavior based on my spiritual beliefs, but in a way of understanding like everything happened exactly how it was supposed to. And I don't regret anything really strongly. In areas that I might feel some regret, that's where I go through the breath process. And I, once I allow myself to accept that regret, then I can get to a place of like, okay, I feel good about it and I'm not carrying that negative energy within me. This is mind blowing. Okay. This is not in my bingo card talking about timelines, but I'm all for it. I, I mean, we'll come back out. We'll chat about timelines and all that stuff. I think that's super interesting. Um, you just said something that kind of caught my attention. Some people believe it. Some people don't. Everything happens for a reason. Are you one of those believers? It sounds like perhaps. Yeah, I think um, everything happens for a reason exactly when it's supposed to. And I think in spiritual circles, people use that to the extreme to what I call spiritually bypass and justify a belief system or a way of being. So I just try to be careful with it. You know, I, um, I look at things, especially if it's like a perceived setback or failure. I'm like, how is this a setup? You know, I look at them as reframes as opposed to getting stuck into the negative. Mm. Yeah, super, super interesting. Uh, I love learning this about people. I'm not entirely sure. I go back and forth and everything happens for a reason, but I, I think I just need more clarity on things. Um, okay, we're going to keep going along with your story. One thing I do want to touch on in the future here is you do your breathwork teacher too, which I think is super interesting. So I'm going to touch on that momentarily. So... You're in this depressed state in 2019. There's a lot of things you can do for depression. Um, go and see a doctor, take medicine, whether you're, you're for or against that. It's different. Go to the gym, go for runs. You can do this, that, whatever. What led you to psychedelics? Then what led you to giving ayahuasca a shot? This goes back to um, everything happening for a reason. And, you know, at... In 2020, my Instagram bio literally said recovering bro. Like I was going so deep publicly with my spirituality that I, I felt like on a subconscious me uh, level, I had to be like, hey, I'm not just some kook, you know, like I used to be really cool and used to be a bro. Like I'm in recovery. <laughs> like I need to justify it. Right. Um, that said, though, like I, I. It's it's for me, it was undeniable. You know, I never really when in my previous years before 2019, very much a meathead, very much like bro energy, whatever. And, you know, I I was dating a 49ers cheerleader at the time and we were on off for four years. And that was a big part to this numbing depression as well. And those times when um, we were off, she would talk about like, how she was working with crystals or like signs or the universe. And I was just I, like, I'd say to her, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like this sounds ridiculous. But then certain times, like there would be undeniable things that would happen. And I'd be like, oh, I, what you're saying, like in a lot of ways, she was, a, she was definitely a gift and a teacher for me for sure. And opened me up to this. And I was getting into yoga and meditation. I heard Joe Rogan uh, on a podcast cast in like 2018 or something talk about how he does yoga and how hard it is and as a man that gave me that metaphorical permission slip to go to a yoga class and selling swag and branded merchandise i had just sold some yoga mats for the san francisco 49ers 
So I had a um, yoga mat with the Niners logo. So I'm like, oh, I'm a man. I, I see, I, I like football and I'm going I'm to- I'm laughing inside, class. but this is the way that so many of us think, including myself. So I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's why that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, <laughs> just to see the full evolution here, like, and to paint the picture, because sometimes I'm such a different person that now, and I forget how to connect to people- uh, that are like how I was, mm. right? Because mm. everything you're saying, like, I'm like, yeah, I remember when I felt that way too, <laughs> um, you know? And I think it's it's super healthy too, especially now like that I go so deep down the spiritual um, rabbit hole. I meet a lot of people that are just like all cut up in the fluff and I'm like, well, let's ground a little bit here. Uh, so to answer your question about why ayahuasca, there's different things. Yeah, I, I tried TM, Transcendental Meditation. Um, I tried a bunch of different things. In 2018, have you seen the movie Limitless? Oh, a long time Cooper? ago. It was a pill, right? And you can like yeah. remember everything or something? Yeah, so nature? this... If you guys are into movies, write down Limitless. It's with Bradley Cooper. And just like Ryan said, there was basically this magic pill that helped to light the uh, neural pathways on your brain so you could access more of your subconscious mind, essentially, and just like be in peak performance. Well, that movie came out in maybe like 2013 or something. I don't know, something kind of like that. But now nootropics like, say, Alpha Brain or any of the Lion's Mane, nootropics are a huge industry. It's like the healthy and safe version of what that movie was about. Hmm. And that includes microdosing as well with psilocybin or even LSD. So back to my story in 2018, synchronistically like this was weird stuff you know my buddy and i had a podcast called what up silicon valley we interviewed randy Hahn, who is the voice of the san jose sharks the hockey team he's an eight-time emmy win a winner and he was in the movie inside out so he was part of uh, inside out as well so love he's a that big movie. name love it oh me too uh, so randy Hahn, it was a big deal for us to interview him and we just did this interview. Then coincidentally, I saw someone else that was, and no one, not many people were doing content creation in 2017 and in Silicon Valley and doing it with the local movers and shakers. Like we were the guys. That's what led me to being named Silicon Valley's 40 under 40, being a podcaster of interviewing movers and shakers in the South Bay of Silicon Valley. So we interviewed this legend, Randy Hahn, Synchronistically, I see someone else interview him, but in a blog form with a very similar vibe to us and also um, just the style of interview. So I, re I looked at this guy. I was like, did he rip us off? And then I did the time and it just came out like the same time. There's no way like he would have just ripped us off. Right. Yeah, but yeah. like the ego in me was got defensive right away. And we could think of the movie Inside Out, like the inner parts coming online. Right. So anyways, I reached out to this guy. He starts telling me about microdosing with mushrooms. Like we become friends. I'm fast forwarding and, and you know, a lot of different similarities. So he just randomly came into my life, just like in the movie Limitless, that how this guy randomly came into Bradley Cooper's life to deliver him this message of this quote unquote magic pill. So this guy's telling me about microdosing with mushrooms. And I'm like, oh man, in high school in college i love mushrooms but i'm a professional i don't i can't do mushrooms now he's like no it's microdosing here are some articles about silicon valley executives working with it like it's a legit thing i'm like all right i'll try that so i started to microdose and it was incredible it was just so good just some small um shifts within me not anything big but it led to big things and then he starts telling me about ayahuasca and I was like, I what a, and there's <laughs> something, right? You know, there's something in me that was like, you know, what? I don't know what you're talking about, but I feel like I'm probably going to do that one day, like if I'm desperate. So I tell that story one, because it's kind of funny and it's relatable, but also because that's the link to ayahuasca. The stage was set. It primed me to be ready for it like a year in advance. And then by the time the numbing depression came in 2019, this gets into another one of my long stories. So I'll chunk up and just keep it <laughs> high level. But basically went to a cacao ceremony, first time like experiencing cacao. 
And the woman I went with, she asked the facilitator about ayahuasca. And then basically I had a conversation with her and then it just kind of all fell into place. And I was at a rock bottom where I was like, I don't know what's happening right now. I don't know what signs are. I don't know what being called to the medicine means. I don't have any of this vernacular, but something is going on here where I'm being led there. I'm scared shitless. I don't really want to do this thing, but at the same time, I'm very intrigued and something is happening that's happening clearly for me. So just being at that ultimate place of surrender is what ultimately brought me to sit with ayahuasca in 2019. Wow. Wow. Okay. We're, we're going to pick up there in just a moment. Um, yeah. One thing I, I wrote down is at some point you stopped caring what people thought. How did you get there? Because if you're writing that, like, what was like a former bro or recovering bro or on your Instagram, you are very outwardly proud of what kind of like where you are. How did you get to the point where you just stopped giving a shit about what people thought about you? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic helped a lot. The lockdowns in 2020, you know, I looked at it as a gift and I looked at it as an opportunity with respect to the devastation and lives lost, um, you know, for my own emotional and mental well-being and my own psyche. I looked at it as an opportunity to go deeper into doing the work. And I joined a community called Fit for Service, which was really helpful to be with like-minded uh, people. And I was learning a lot more, too. And it was just baby steps, you know, I went from like recovering bro to like, uh, like owning your woo as a recovering bro, you know, to just these different evolutions of like uh, content I would share. And then over time, it just it was like one thing after another. And by the time I did my yoga teacher training in December of 2021, uh, um, you know, that was the thing that really got me to be like, wow, I did. I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm here. I don't want to teach yoga, but I, again, like just was called here. So I'm here. And the first two days I was showing up to like, you know, showing up in the yoga teacher training when we would practice, um, like giving cues and things like that, not really with my heart. And I was like, you know, what? I got to show up differently and just pretend like I want to do this. And that was probably the moment where it shifted in me. And then within a week of being at the training, I was like, wow, I do want to go home and teach yoga. And teaching yoga in 2022, like January of 2022, uh, I think that was the pivotal moment of really going from like, oh, I need to like justify this to being like this is who i am you know mm -hmm. that's a great feeling when you get there if you get there that's a wonderful feeling where you just stop caring what everybody else thinks you just focus on you and your happiness i'm genuinely curious about this um you seem very aware of your signs and surroundings like around you um did you pick that up because of the girl that you were dating i don't imagine you could always be that way if you're so dead focused on this business and, and you know, then the money and, and everything that comes with that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think sometimes I have an issue with being very aware of like my surroundings and perhaps things are happening around me because I am so dead set and so goal driven and, and I'm really just hyper focused sometimes. Were you always aware of things happening around you or did that, that pick up at some point? Yeah, no way. Um, I would say before 2019, um, microdosing sh definitely helped microdosing with psilocybin. Uh, since then, though, since ayahuasca, it's been a slowing down, you know, and it's still something I'm working on. And moving from Silicon Valley to the beaches of Santa Cruz has been tremendous because almost every day I go to the beach and the pelicans, the seals, you know, or even if it's just at my house, I have the crows out here every single day. I'm looking at the crows and I'm kind of like raven hunting, being like, oh, is that a raven? Nope, it's a little bit small. But, you know, <laughs> just the little things, noticing when the wind picks up, what's the thought I just had when the wind picked up? You know, is that related or am I trying to make these connections? Um, but all of that is the journey I've been on in these past five years. Before sitting with ayahuasca, I wouldn't say that was really a thing for me. Wow. So ayahuasca was really like a huge turning point in your life. And I'm guessing that's where the whole soul life balance was born. Yeah. I want to kind of connect those dots a little bit. I mean, we don't need to go about your whole 
ayahuasca trip and what happened and all that kind of stuff. But obviously ayahuasca kind of reframed some things in your brain. Um, so perhaps like what was your biggest or big, biggest takeaways after your trip with ayahuasca and you return home? What do you, what are you thinking at that moment? Yeah. Getting, getting out toxic relationship I was in, it took about six months or so to really end that relationship, maybe longer. Uh, moving from Silicon Valley to Santa Cruz, um, slowly transitioning out of the business I was in. Those are a few of the things. Getting out of the fantasy football league I was in, switching all the content I was consuming to just be of topics that were interesting to me at the time. And for me, it was going down the rabbit hole, the, the nature of reality and existence and what is infinity means and who, if God created us, then who created God and who actually created uh, the human race and going down like the alien extraterrestrial type rabbit hole. So a lot of uh, fun, different rabbit holes, um, but I literally like changed everything in my life. Um, and it was just like a slow process over the next couple of years. Okay, so I lied. We're going to touch a little bit on the trip that you had to ask you because I'm curious to know, you came yeah. back and changed everything. What was the visualization or what was like the moment that kind of like was the aha moment for you? Hard to say because it's been so many years now and it's just like stories at this point. Um, all those things that I mentioned, you know, they're like different aspects that came in that kind of taught me these lessons or showed me um, different things. Um, there wasn't really like one pivotal point other than at the end of the first night of the ceremony, um, there were just some specific synchronicities that came through that um, helped me to not gaslight myself because after the ceremony was over, you know, typically what they do is they bring out some food and you eat and you're just kind of like laughing if you feel okay with laughing. Sometimes I'm like, how are you laughing right now? You know, <laughs> um, but it's a good place to get to a, a place of like humor and just kind of like being with the community. We're in a yurt and basically a large, large tent. And when I looked up, I was starting to gaslight myself, like be like, did did I just lose my mind, you know, and everything I was just shown, like, how am I ever going to be able to do all this or any of this? Like, this seems impossible. And I just started to be like, yeah, I don't know, you know, go down a negative path. And then I looked at the altar kind of like in the middle where it's got candles and different things and crystals. There was a dragon that was facing directly towards me. And I could have sworn the dragon was like off to the the side not in front of me and i was born on the year of dragon i've always felt like connected to dragons but that was just like interesting i looked up and from the reflection of the candles in the center because some of the candles were burnt, like tea light candles those small ones because some of them were either burned out or blown out um for me, when I looked up at the top of the yurt, I saw a smiley face directly looking at me, but anyone else's vantage point, they wouldn't have that smiley face or any other smiley face. And one of the things that came up that I didn't mention was around my dog, Riley, and um, her needing to go live with my parents for uh, several different reasons. And one of the girls in our ceremony she had brought her dogs and the dogs were outside the tent. They were somewhere out, you know, in someone's room or something. And all of a sudden, like I just had the dragon thing. I had the lights and I'm, I'm starting to gaslight myself and I'm starting to come around like, these are interesting signs, if mm -hmm. you will. I'm like, mm -hmm. but they're not that clear. And I'm starting, then all of a sudden, and I do remember this pretty clear. Um, I started to be like, there's that thing with my dog, Riley. How am I, how is she ever going Am I abandoning her? It's saying her to my parents. Are they going to be okay with it? What am I doing? Like all these thoughts and just be like, how I love her and I want her to live with me and all of this. And then all of a sudden the facilitator walks in and she goes, oh, I just, I just checked on the dogs and they're, they're perfect. They're just cuddled up on each other. They're just so happy. And, you know, they're just such pack animals. And one of the big messages that came through in my ceremony as it relates to my dog is, 
my dad bred her mom. So my parents have her mom and they have her sister. And her mom and her sister are very calm golden retrievers. Mine is a nut. She's insane. And mm -hmm. with my my hustle lifestyle and all the different things, like it just wasn't fitting anymore. And I was like, if any of these dogs, like Riley needs to be with the pack. She needs to be like, I literally had this thought. So then the facilitator came in using like the same type of uh, terms and vernacular that was going through my mind. And that's where that would be the moment where I was like, I don't know what's going on. Like, this is kind of <laughs> freaky. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. As a dog person and someone that's had a dog for over two decades, I completely understand like how that would be such a stressful situation. I love my dogs and parting with them would be one of the hardest things I could ever do. So I completely understand that stress. So where in the world does soul life balance come out of all of this? And what is the definition of that? Soul life balance is about prioritizing your mental health while recategorizing work as a part of the human experience. In other words, we can look at work and life and equate them to the archetypal energies of yin and yang or yang. And the yang energy is the archetypal energy of the masculine. And I'm not talking about uh, the masculine like genitalia. What I'm talking about when I say archetypal is the energy. So the qualities of yang or the qualities of the masculine is outward expression. It's about how we show up in the world with our five senses. It has everything to do with obligations and responsibilities. The yin energy is equated to the feminine, which we all have the feminine in us as well. And the, and the yin energy or the feminine is about the internal world of our mental and emotional well-being. And for those of us that feel a connection to something greater than the human experience, maybe religion and or something like spirituality. So now that we can see the, 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 the energies of yin and yang, we can equate that to work-life balance. And we can see that both work and life is that yang energy because it's obligations and responsibilities and how we show up in the world. So first and foremost, me being someone that was chasing work-life balance and having had a seven-figure business while working less than four hours a day, I clearly had work-life balance, right? Yet it wasn't enough. So this led to the reframe of soul-life balance where soul is about the inner world, our mental and emotional state. And it's about prioritizing that and recategorizing work as part of life. Furthermore, which gets into some conspiracy theories here is like, if we look at the term work-life balance, we can see that the W in work is obviously closer to Z than the L in life. Well, typically in terms like this, the letter that is closer to the A, not always, but typically, it would be the letter that is closer to the A would go first. Therefore, it should be life-work balance. And life-work balance makes a hell of a lot more sense than work-life balance because the way work-life balance is positioned is about our mental and emotional well-being. I don't know the actual origin of like if there was, you know, people in a committee being like, what should we call this thing? And it was like, oh, work-life <laughs> balance. But we can see the subliminal programming of saying work before life and how that impacts our subconscious mind. So what my invitation is for anyone is to at least extend the this version of work-life balance to life-work balance, because I understand the idea of soul-life balance can be triggering to some, for sure. But for me and for anyone that wants to improve their mental and emotional health, which would be anyone that's into personal development and bettering themselves, then I would encourage to prioritize soul life balance as opposed to life work or work life balance. And the message came through and, and that first night of the ayahuasca ceremony, at this point, I don't even remember how it came. I just remember being like, I don't know what to do with that. And it took me over two years, two to three years to really unpack that and to embody it and figure out like what it meant. And then in 2022, I published my fourth book called uh, Soul Life Balance, A Guide to Igniting and Integrating Spiritual Awakenings. Amazing. Congratulations on that. Thanks. You were losing me for a moment when you said the alphabet thing, but you grabbed me right back in when you said the whole live 
life work balance instead of work life balance. Completely understand that. As if somebody, I do marketing, do a lot of design work, stuff mm. like that. It's always like the first word or the first person you put on is always a priority. When you write an email, I think everybody thinks about who do I want to type in first and then who's like BCC or CC or whatever it is afterwards. We're always like focusing on who we want to do first. So what you said there makes complete sense. And the term, I think a lot of us have heard, what is it? Work to live, not live to work. Something Ooh, I try yeah. to focus on a lot. Oof, it is hard. It is hard. It's like once you're in this hamster wheel of life and working, and then you just have all these responsibilities and priorities, then you got the bills, and then you got the paychecks coming in, and you got to pay everything off. And it's like, how how in the world do you just step out of that if if that's what you're looking to do? Um, and then it's like, you know, my wife and I talk about uh, our jobs and are we happy and stuff like that. And for the, for the most part, we are. But it's like there's a lot of stressful situations. And it's like, how much stress is too much stress? Um, you know, then they kind of keep you hooked with like uh, the whole vesting period. If you stay in three years, we'll vest your retirement and uh, we give you great benefits. And there's just all these like teeth that are just sunk in you to kind of keep you. And it's really hard to to step away for somebody that is let's say in those shoes that are like they just can't get out of the work the work life thing they're just stuck in it and they don't know how to get out of it they think this is what life's supposed to be i work really hard i put in extra hours i'm stressed like crazy but i'm getting the paycheck but they don't like it where would you suggest perhaps they start to look and give them perhaps the confidence that they can actually step back and step out of this wheel of life yeah, it's such a great question. I, I understand that. You know, when I was writing Soul Life Balance, I didn't have the answer to that question. And I, I, I extremely struggled in writing that book without having the answer to that question. And I think that is um, one of the most challenging things, you know, especially with spiritual awakenings. Uh, one of the number one constants I see and most people would agree with is a career transition is looming. So career is like one of those things that hasn't fully been addressed. I will say in my new book, Overcome the Overwhelm, one of the things that we dive into is internal and external overwhelm. So in the book, what I'm mostly prioritizing in teaching is how to sit with that internal overwhelm because a lot of these external uh, situations in terms of like the job, the career, the bills, all that, that's coming up in our internal world of how we feel about it. So I believe first that we need to do the shadow work. And I talk about that in the book as well. That's the term Carl Jung uh, coined, which means to make the unconscious conscious, the unconscious mind or the subconscious mind makes it up 95% of our awareness, the thoughts and feelings we don't have access to. Shadow work is just about shining a light on the parts of our mind we don't have access to. It's about being open and honest with ourselves and having those difficult conversations with ourselves of being like, is this truly in alignment? And the definition of alignment is what we think, what we feel, what we say, and how we act all match. And when those all match, then we're in alignment. So a lot of the work is in the internal world, like the thoughts and feelings. That's, that's what my work really stems in. And then after that, we can start to roll up our sleeves and be like, all right, now that I've processed these things and I start to have some answers and I have some clarity and I know where these certain things are out of alignment, now, let me make some positive changes, right? Let me prioritize this in a way that is accessible. You know, there's an ancient uh, saying that goes, how, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Mm -hmm. And it's cliche to say, but it's like it's chunking down into making these to do lists and then prioritizing it in a way that you can approach these without feeling overwhelmed. Some of them are going to be big things. Like I mentioned the thing with my dog. Or I mentioned moving from uh, Silicon Valley to Santa Cruz. I mentioned the career transition. So out of those three things, let's just take like integrating. To integrate means to take action, whether it's something that's coming up through just, you know, 
a meditation, a breath work, a journaling, uh, just sitting with yourself and asking these questions or to deep dive like ayahuasca. The most important thing you do is you integrate. That is to take action. So just to use this example to bring it full circle, my move from Silicon Valley to Santa Cruz was about a three-month time period. The, the relationship that we were together three, four years, that was about a six, eight-month time period. The career transition, here I am five years later still working on the career transition because I'm no, my business got destroyed in the pandemic. My mm. business is gone. I had a good plan you know, of just like kind of uh, operate, but now it's, it's gone. So now I'm totally rebuilding and I'm nowhere near where I was financially or with my career. So I'm five years later, I'm still working on that. And then in regard to my dog, she went to live with my parents full time last year. So that was four years later mm -hmm. um, because it got to a point where they're like, oh, wow, we see what you're saying. And now like, I miss her all the time. Luckily, my parents live close and I see them all the time. We see each other. But at the same time, like we all know, like she's way better off with them than the living situation I have uh, with her. And she's got a ton of health issues. And my dad is very much into, he breeds dogs, you know, like he's going to do better <laughs> for her than Good me. Good situation. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Good situation. So what I just described here in these examples are some of the overwhelming type experiences that I've I've had over the past five years, along with timelines of understanding, like really approaching these priority priorities and being real with them. Because the worst thing someone can do when it relates to the career is make a rash decision and be like, you know what, this is I did ayahuasca once. I don't like this corporate job. And, you know, <laughs> I feel empowered and I'm just going to be a coach, you know, and then leave it all behind. Like, that's the worst thing that someone can do. So it's just about like one step at a time. I appreciate those timelines because it also reminds me of like, we follow our fitness influencers and they show these like before and after photos. It's like, like I've been working out crazy hard for two weeks and I don't look anything like that. I, blah, 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 right. You don't see the timelines and like them waking up at 5am, them eating well, them being strict, all that kind of stuff. You don't, you don't see that. So to get actual realistic timelines, I think makes people feel a little better. Like they don't have to make any rash decisions or jump to the next big thing or just you know, make a complete 180 in life, which can be very overwhelming. And that really tests your mental health, which is, you know, a whole nother thing. So what you mentioned reminded me, um, of a book that I had, I had heard of a few years ago. And now that I have a son, I cannot wait to read it to him when he's old enough to understand. Um, but the book is called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. Have you ever heard of this? I haven't. I would highly recommend it. Um, I have not read fully through it. I have skimmed the pages and I'm reading all the quotes from it. I'm like, this is absolutely freaking incredible. But anyways, it's um, this book the boy and, and these animals are taking a journey. And one of the quotes from this book is, I can't see a way through, said the boy. Can you see your next step, said the horse. And the boy says, yes. And the horse says, just take that. Hmm. Like, I, I saw that quote and I was like, woof, get a little bit of chills. The whole book is like, is like that. And, uh, I saw the book in the bookstore about a year ago, not even a year ago. And I was like, I knew I was having a boy and I was like, I'm buying this and I can't wait to read this to him. Cause if these are like the lessons that I wish I knew when I was younger and um, yeah, it's one of those things where I think, I think a lot of us fail to take small steps, um, have realistic expectations and not just take those, try to take those incredible leaps. Then you fail and then you're back to where you are. Then you're even more depressed and all that stuff. So giving your timelines genuine genuinely uh, appreciate that. Do you work with people? I hear a lot of people talk to you about like the narratives that they create in their head and how it's usually worse than what reality really is. <laughs> You're laughing because I think, I don't know, maybe I surround myself with people, including myself that does that. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you get out of that? How do you stop doing that? Because I feel, especially in the workplace, like 
if I don't do this by five o'clock, I, I'm going to get reprimanded and I might get fired and all that stuff. Like you start telling yourself these stories that just create all this unnecessary stress and tension in your life. What do you tell the people that have a tendency to do that? Yeah, that's the breath process in my new book. And this guy Love goes it. back. I'm happy rating on that. Good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this basically goes back to your previous question about like, uh, how do we actually approach this overwhelm? And what we're both saying is like, hey, know that's there, create a plan, small steps. And in the meantime, get your inner world in order. So when we're experiencing that stress, that chaos, chaotic state, whatever it looks like for someone, know that emotions are energy in motion. And that's not just a catchy phrase. It's true and it's backed by science. Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor delivered a TED talk in 2008 and it, she's a neuroanatomist. Her TED talk is what blew up TED and it also blew up her career. That year she was on Oprah and she was named to Times Most 100 Influential People. Wow. In her TED talk as a neuroanatomist, she said that we have a 90 second physiological response when we experience an emotion. Now, if we stack this with emotions being energy that are in motion, most of us don't want to feel that stress about the deadline coming up or whatever it might be. So we numb, we distract, we avoid ourselves. Whereas if we can allow ourselves to feel that energy, it moves through us. But when we distract it, it gets stuck and it gets stored in the body. Mm -hmm. Then the next stressor comes up. Then we have more stress and then we have this and then we have that. And then we have so much stress and we don't know what to do with it. So the number one thing you can do is catch it in the moment. Now I could go so much deeper about nervous system regulation, breath work exercises, breath work journeys. But for this specific example, like I got this thing do that do I got to get the kids later and whatever it might be just like those normal everyday stressors that we all experience the breath process know that emotions are energy in motion we process those energies in 90 seconds and what we can do in those 90 seconds is act the actual breath process it's summarized in three simple themes breathe feel and think intentionally those are the themes. So it's like, hey, if anything, when those stressors come up, remember you can process it in 90 seconds. If you breathe, meaning you allow yourself to slow down, if you allow yourself to feel those energies and do the shadow work, ask what those energies are revealing to you. And then finally, think intentionally. Now is when we've earned the right to invoke the power of positive thinking and and look for different habits and or actions and behaviors that we can take as a result of what came up. Is this something you do on a daily basis, multiple times a day, or like how often do you yeah. practice this? Yeah, you know, I tell people all the time like, hey, I don't want you doing the breath process all the time because if you're doing the breath process all the time, it's not working. It's designed <laughs> so that like, you're actually hitting on every single one of these points. Like the H in the breath process is habits to integrate. If you're constantly coming back to the same story and the same experience and the same emotions, it's not working for you. But if you're actually hitting on each and every one of these steps, all of a sudden you don't need to go through the steps anymore because things aren't coming up as much. And when things do come up because they're new, they're different, whatever it is, now it's on autopilot. You're like, okay, let me just breathe, feel, think intentionally. That, that's the three themes of the six step breath process summarized. But like when you first go through it, it's like, okay, um, there's a different chapter for each of the steps in the book. And this is why I give keynotes on. So it's, it's a lot to unpack. But like after you've tried it a few times and you build it into just your way of being, it gets uh, to a place of autopilot. Like I go to the gym just to use the steam room. You know, when I'm in the steam room and cold plunge or sauna, anything like that, it's a great time for me to just check in. How am I feeling? Where, where in my life, either today or yesterday or even past few days or week, whatever, have I compartmentalized something? Because now's the chance. Now's when I'm going to take that thing that I compartmentalized put in a box, I put it in a shelf. Now's where I'm going to open up that box and unpack it. So I'm not carrying it because I don't need to carry that. Wow. How has this changed your life for the good? It, 
so much better. I'm able to process things in real time. I mean, before I didn't have a system last year, 2023, my life entirely imploded and I just need to go deeper on the work. And I was doing everything I could to um, surrender. And I was just looking up different teachers on, as it relates to breath work, reprogramming the subconscious mind. And it's like books, programs, this, that. And then once you get in, it's like a scavenger hunt once you get in. And I'm like, this isn't working. You know, like my, my YouTube channel, which I don't put much on my YouTube channel, but it's called Spirituality Simplified. My thing is about simplifying things and making it accessible. I'm like, forget about everyone else right now. I just need something that works for me, right? right? Like I'm not building this to help other people. Like I am like, hitting every single panic button. My life just imploded. It's the most challenging time in my life. I'm not necessarily depressed, but this is what I was experiencing in 2023. So I was like, I just need something. So I took uh, like a, a bunch of different teachers and pro processes and I put it in a crock pot essentially, you know, and just let it stew. And then about six, eight months later, um, yeah, I mean, at that time I had a process. It was a little clunky and chunky. But then January about of 2024, about six, eight months later, that's when I started to write the book and the breath process just came out in the writing of the book. And I was like, wow, this is digestible. This is something that I can come back to easily. And now that I've embodied it for myself, I can share it with other people. So the way it's changed my life is to help me in, in the most challenging time of my life. That's how this breath process was born. Amazing. When did that book come out? uh may of 2024 that's awesome congratulations on that is that book number is that four is that book number six four? six wow we just skipped a few in there wow that's yeah, wild woof. I, I need i need to create one let alone six that's uh i need to get off my ass and do well that. apparently i'm an author so you know well, i'll knock on your door if i need some help with the, yeah. the whole publishing process um I'm going to wind down here but i this this question popped up literally out of nowhere and i feel like i need to ask you this do you recognize the power of saying no? Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like, mm, yeah, <laughs> let me unpack that. I got so good at saying no when I was building my business back in those days that we were talking about as an entrepreneur. Like, um, I had to learn to say yes, you know, and I'm, I'm very good at, uh, I think right now I, I have a good balance, but yeah, I, I recognize the power of saying no. Because I, I just ask that because I feel like you've got a good balance now. You've been through a lot with, I actually thought it would have been the other way around with your business. You'd probably say, yes, 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 yes. Just to kind of just keep building your business. And once you get to a place where you're very comfortable in your skin and you're comfortable with who you are, you'll say, no, 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 no. And yeah, um, yeah I think it's something that I mean, a lot of us, including myself, have trouble doing. And when you do say no, and you don't take so much on your plate, it allows you to be present and focus on the things that are right in front of you instead of like stretching yourself thin, trying to help so many other people, let alone yourself and everything you've got to do. Um, I figured you were the perfect person. It just came into my head. Like, I wonder if you've recognized the power of yeah. saying no, because that's something I, th I think a lot. I, th I, just, I just think a lot of, about things that I do want to pass down to my son. And that's something I, I have a journal um, in my, in my notes and on, uh, on my phone about lessons I want to teach my son. And the power of no is definitely one of them. It's, it's something that I was not taught. It's like when you're a kid, it's always like share and yes, and show up for other people and be there and do all that stuff. But I don't think anybody ever really uh, mentions like, don't stress yourself thin. Make sure your cup is full before you can start helping others. When you help others on an empty cup, then everybody's depressed and no one wins. So um, I don't know. I, I, that just randomly came into my head. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I love it. I love it. Okay. I'm going to end it with this question. This is a heavy one. It's the pursuit of happiness. I feel the need to, to ask this. Um, but I, I wrote this. I don't ask this because my podcast is a pursuit of happiness. Um, however, when I wrote this down in my notes, I asked this because I'm talking to you. What brings people actual happiness? Because you are somebody that in this world of 2024 and probably beyond, you had the money, you had the business, um, you were recognized, right? You had a podcast, you were top 40 under 40, people know who you were, um, and yet you were depressed. So 
a lot of that is now gone by the wayside. You seem to be happier now. I could be wrong. I'm assuming you're happier now. You got this whole process. Yeah. Now you got the whole soul life balance and all this stuff. And you just shook your head. Yes. <laughs> I knew it. Um, what actually makes people happy? Because everybody, not everybody, many, many people are still going after what made you unhappy. And we continue to do it over and over and over again. So the floor is yours. Yeah. I love this question. So the way I close my uh, my keynote speeches, and I think the TED, it started with the TEDx, is with the movie Soul. Have you seen the Pixar movie Soul? I have not. I, oh, I watched that. your TEDx and I was like, God, I got to see that movie. Yep. That, that's a good one to watch with your son too. Yeah, that's a fantastic movie. But for anyone listening, you know, as a refresher or introduction to the movie, it's about this character who has a near-death experience and is gifted a second opportunity to live his life. And at the end of the movie, it's not really a spoiler, uh, but at the end of the movie, he's asked... Uh, how, where, how, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And he's like, I'm not sure, but I do know I'm going to live every minute of it. And that's it right there. The question I typically sit with for myself and I encourage other people is how can I feed my soul today? Or, or cause that is a trigger for some people. What is one thing I can do for myself today? And it's not any of this end destination type stuff focusing on like, oh, when I get ABC, I will feel X, Y, Z or any of that. It's just straight up like, what is something I can do for me today? And this goes back to what you just said about saying no and filling your cup first. I mean, it's as simple as taking it day by day and realizing that we have all these excuses why we can't do certain things. But when we're able to get past those voices, maybe using the breath process, then we can get to some clarity being like, well, even though I really want to go deep sea fishing today, I know that's not going to be possible, you know, <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. the thing might be. But what is one thing that is practical and realistic that I could do that would actually help to bring some joy into my life today? And, and it's that simple for me. Flip it. That's going to be a real on my... My, my Instagram, <laughs> that is like, you're talking, I'm like, well, you're speaking right to me. That is, that is awesome. You're also speaking from experience. You can tell, um, Sam, once more, the floor is yours. How do you want to close this up? Is there any final words that you want to share with the people? Brian, this was a, a lot of fun. Honestly, like you're a great host. I really appreciate your energy. I resonate with you. I, I, I've been thinking about it recently. I'm like, how many podcasts have I done this year? Because <laughs> I'm like, it's got to be like 30 or 50, but I, I really, really, truly enjoyed this one. So keep up the incredible work. You truly are a great host and awesome at guiding the conversation. So Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, that means a yeah, lot to me. Right? It's nice to hear that, right? Yeah, so. I I mean this this whole this whole podcast is uh very much a passion project in mind with a with a capital P and passion. Like I love doing this and this is it's amazing and, and the amount of information I've been able to learn and share with my audience and now hopefully your audience is just yeah. like the value of that is you there is no value of that. It's 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 unbelievable. So thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, no, this was a ton of fun. Thank you again for providing the platform and for anyone that wants to go deeper with me, um, my website's samkabert.com, K-A-B-E-R-T. You can find all the information there. I do have a breath club, which is an online community as well. So if you want to learn more about practicing soul life balance or nervous system regulation, I invite you to join us in the breath club. It's just 50 bucks a month and cancel any time. So very low commitment. So cool. I'm glad you said that. I've, all the links will be in your show notes, including your books. Uh, so please definitely scroll down and check that out. And you are welcome to come back and we can dive deeper into timelines and time travel <laughs> and stuff like that. You it's super, it. hey, I'm open-minded. Uh, to me, it's super interesting. I, I'm, I'm really starting to try to learn more about like the, the energies and like not just timelines, but like um, alternate realities and all that kind of stuff. I mean, who knows, right? It could all be just garbage or it can actually perhaps be legit and, and, I don't know. It's one of life's biggest questions. And it, it, to me, it's just mesmerizing. I absolutely love talking about it at the very least. So come back on. But until then, thank you so much. And 
continued success with your book and your breath work is awesome. It's good stuff and, and really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely.